Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we, if we confess, confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. is always to have mercy. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent, penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading for the third Sunday in the season of Lent, taken from the Old Testament, book of Exodus, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, a priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in blazing fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but the bush was not burning up. So he said, I will go over and look at this amazing sight to find out why the bush is not burning up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to take a look, God called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, I am here. The Lord said, Do not come any closer. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. He then said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have certainly seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their cry for help because of their slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now indeed the Israelites' cry for help has come to me. Yes, I have seen how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. This will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I say to them? So God replied to Moses, I am who I am. He also said, You will say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also told Moses, say this to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered from generation to generation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now join in singing the Psalm of the Day, Psalm 85. Thank you.
second reading for this morning is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. He had them die in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples to warn us not to desire evil things the way they did. Do not become idolaters like some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to celebrate wildly. And let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Let us not put Christ to the test, as some of them did. And so we're being destroyed by the serpents. Do not grumble, as some of them grumbled, and were destroyed by the destroyer. All these things that were happening to them and had meaning as examples. And they were written down to warn us, to whom the end of the ages has come. So let him who thinks he stands be careful that he does not fall. No testing has overtaken you except ordinary testing, but God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability, but when he tests you, he will also bring about the outcome that you are able to bear it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as we sing the gospel acclamation. Of the gospel according to St. Luke chapter 13. At that time there were some priests who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. He answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? I tell you no, but unless you repent you will all perish too. Or those 18 who were killed when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all the people living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all perish too. He told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the gardener, look, for three years now I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why, even let it use up the soil. But the gardener replied to him, Sir, leave it alone this year also, till I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. If it produces fruit next year, fine. But if not, then cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Text for this morning is the Gospel lesson of the day. Take from the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. At that time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. He answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will, you will all perish too. Or those 18 who were killed when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the people living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all perish too. He told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, came looking for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the gardener, Look, for three years now I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I found none. Cut it down. Why even let it use up the soil? But the gardener replied to him, Sir, leave it alone for this year also, until I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. If it produces fruit next year, fine. But if not, then cut it down. In the name of our Savior, dear children of God, do you tend to look at life, your life, the life of others, and all that happens in life as sort of a cause and effect? Jesus has a conversation with people this morning about that. They bring up two different things that have happened. And as they think about these two, let's say, horrible accidents and a horrible thing with Pilate that happened, the people think they know the reason why those things happened. The reason they believe that those things happened is they were really bad sinners. Their sin, at least how bad their sin was, caused all this to happen. But as Jesus talks to them and really talks to us, he makes us understand that to think of cause and effect when it comes to things on this world as children of God is just really the wrong way to think. Jesus here reminds us that as Christians, the only way for us to really react to these things is to repent and to live lives of repentance. Now, people came to Jesus with this incident that happened between Pilate and the Galilean. And it must have been well known enough by these people that they don't go into a whole lot of detail. They all knew what they were talking about. And many of the people that were standing around Jesus and telling him these things thought that these Galileans were killed by Pilate because they had done some really bad sin. They were worse sinners than at least we are because we weren't killed. And Jesus stops them and says, Now, do you think that's the reason that they were killed? Do you know that they were worse sinners than you are? Jesus says, That's not really the right way of thinking about things. Instead of looking at others and trying to figure out what they did wrong, Jesus says what you need to do is simply look at your own lives, understand that you're sinners too, and repent. And then Jesus himself brings up an incident. He says, do you guys all know about the, the tower in Siloam that fell down and killed so many people? And again, it must have been well known enough that they, they knew what Jesus was talking about. And Jesus again wants them to think about, you know, why did that happen to those people? Maybe think of it in this way. There's all these people standing there and the Tower of Siloam went right here next to you. Why did you live 
That person died. Were you better? Were they worse? Jesus says, wrong way of thinking. Wrong way of thinking because none of us really know the day that we're going to die. And instead of trying to figure out who did what and why, Jesus said, one thing, repent. Don't go down the road that you don't understand. Don't go down the road where you'll find no answers. Repent. Now, have we learned a lesson from what Jesus has taught here? Do we still look for cause and effect today? Well, think for a moment about something we've all gone through for the last two years. COVID. Strange disease. I had it. And I can't even commiserate with you and say, yeah, I know what you went through. Because every single person was different. Some people got really sick. Had to go to the hospital. Others, eh, it was like a cold, they say. Some people died. Others didn't even know they had it unless they tested them. Why the difference? Were some worse sinners than other sinners? Were some better than others? Did, did maybe we look at somebody's life and say, we should figure out what they did because we don't want to do that. See, our tendency is to go down those paths. To look for cause and in fact. But Jesus says, no. That's not the answer. You'll never find what you're looking for there. He simply says, as you look at your own life, understand that we're all going to die someday. So today is the day that you need to repent. And we, we do it in so many areas, don't we? Think about the war that's going on right now over in Ukraine. Why is that happening? What did the Ukrainians do that made God so mad that now he's allowing others to ravage their land? Cause and effect. Why is God, or what did we do that made God so angry that right now our economy seems to be tanking out and we have all these things going on in our society? What did we do? Cause and effect. There are so many wrong paths that you and I can go down. We can look at others' lives and, and those people who have had bad things happen to them. We can analyze their life and say, aha, I know why that happened. Because they did this and this and this. Jesus says, no, no, no. You don't go down that path. We can even look at our own lives and say, you know what? Life's been pretty good lately. God must be happy with me. Jesus says, no, no, no. Don't go down that path. He says there's only really one path that we as Christians ought to go down, and that is one of repentance. To repent. And what does that mean, to repent? First of all, to see our own sin and a need for a Savior. Jesus once said, the healthy do not need a physician, but the sick do. Those who don't see their own sin really don't think that they need a Savior. And how easy it is for us as we think cause and effect to look at our lives and, and maybe things are going well. God has blessed us. And we look at life and we say, God must be happy with me. I must be living a pretty good life to deserve all these things. Maybe I'm not so sinful after all. 
we start going down the road of cause and effect. The less of my sin I see, the less I need a Savior. And the less I need a Savior, the farther I'm going to go away from Jesus. And finally, I am going to get to a point where, you know, I really don't need Jesus all that much. Life is good, and then I'm lost. How many people have gone down that path? How many people have convinced themselves that life is just, in a matter of speaking, making God happy? And God must be happy with me because look at my life. They are lost. And those steps happen so quickly, and so quietly, and so suddenly that maybe we could look at our own lives and we can see where on that timeline we might be as we examine our lives, examine other people's lives. But understand that what we need to do is simply look at our own lives, see our sin and a need for a Savior. And there is but one Savior, and that is Jesus, the one who has come to live and to die and pay for our sins. If Jesus has not paid for our sins, then you have to pay for your own sins, and you can't do it. And so our ears as children of God must be attuned to the voice of our Savior who simply says today, repent. We're sinful human beings. Look to Jesus as your only Savior. But Jesus this morning doesn't stop there. He has a little bit more for us to think about as he reminds us to repent, but then live lives of repentance. We need to understand that a life of repentance does not save you. Jesus does. But a life of repentance is an indicator, a sign, a marker that we have repented and we look to Jesus as our Savior from sin because Jesus tells us a parable. He really wants us to understand this. He says there was a man who liked figs. So much so that he planted a fig tree. He wanted figs. And he took up some of the, the land in his vineyard to plant this fig tree. That's how much he liked figs. He wanted figs. And he came to his fig tree again and again and again. Year after year he came to that fig tree. And no figs. Finally had enough. He said, evidently either you're not a fig tree or you're a sick fig tree. You're not going to give me the figs that I desire. Cut it down. Why should it take up the space? I, this is good space here. <coughs> but then the gardener steps in and the gardener says, well, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Let, let me show it a little more attention. And, and let's see what happens. Maybe, maybe it'll give us figs. And if it gives us figs, great, wonderful, you have what you want. But if it doesn't give figs, we'll cut it down. Now James tells us such faith if it is alone and has not works, is dead. Faith brings forth fruits, faith. Just like fig tree brings forth 
Figs. Maybe we can understand it this way. What does a fig tree do? It brings forth figs. And why? Because that's what a fig tree does. What does faith in Jesus do? It brings forth fruits of faith. And why? Because that's what faith does. And so you and I can't see faith in and of itself. It's in here. God can see it. And so what we really need to do sometimes is to, in a way, stop life and look at our lives and maybe the, the lives of our family and around us and ask ourselves the question, are there any fruits on that tree? Do we see fruits of faith showing up in my own life? In the lives of the people around me? Because whether we like it or not, the owner of the vineyard, God, is going to come looking. Again, and again, and again, and again, throughout our entire life, God is going to come looking. And he's looking for fruits. He's not going to look at a, uh, a faith of a person and say, well, there's no faith there, and let it alone, and let it alone, and let it alone. God finally does get to a point where he's going to say, all right, cut it down. And there is something inside of us that says, well, when, when, when's God say that? We'll, we'll, we'll stop just before that point, won't we? We don't know. And personally, I don't want to find out. <clears throat> and that's why it is so, so important that the gardener digs around you, fertilizes you. And what's that? That's the Holy Spirit working in your heart through the gospel in word and sacrament. Do you see why this is so important on a Sunday morning? We're not doing anything really for God. God here is doing everything for us. He's digging around us this morning. He's fertilizing us this morning so that we can go out and hang on to faith for another week. Because if he doesn't do that, we're dead. Your faith, whatever may be there, will die. And God will stand there and say, cut it down. It certainly isn't doing what it's supposed to do. See, that is what is so important about the gospel in word and sacrament because it's through that, the means of grace, that God works in here and in here. Creating faith in, in the baby, Kaylee, who is going to be baptized in our second service. Creating, strengthening, building faith, making it that faith remains in our heart, making it that that faith brings forth fruits of faith that God is looking for. And maybe here's a good time to look at a little red flag that may be showing up in many people's lives. As you look at your life, do you see the desire to hear the word of God? The desire to receive the Lord's Supper? slowly fading away.
But you know, this is really isn't all that important, is it? Man, I got so many other things I could do on a Sunday morning, a Thursday night, a Wednesday night. Is it really that important? Our faith, it should be raising red flags, red flags, red flags, because without it, cut it down. Why should it take up the soil? I don't know about you, but to me, that's a frightening thing to hear God say. Especially when he has placed in front of us his gospel. And he promises that through that gospel, he is going to dig around us. And through that gospel, he's going to fertilize us. And he's going to keep our faith alive stronger and stronger and stronger every day. And yet we say, no thanks. I'll do it another way. Now maybe it's time we each take a personal inventory of our faith. Don't slip into that idea of cause and effect to look at other people's lives and try to find out what they did wrong and say to myself, well, I won't do that and then God will be happy with me. Or maybe to look at my own life and say, you know, life's pretty good. God must be happy with me. No, to, to simply listen to our Savior's voice and repent. To stand before God and say, yes, God, I am a poor, miserable sinner. And then to hear those wonderful words from him that we are allowed to hear every Sunday morning, your sins are forgiven. And then live a life of repentance, a life of praise and thanks to God for what he has done. He has forgiven you. He promises to strengthen your faith. Finally, he promises to take you to heaven. Yes, tune your ears to the voice of your Savior. Repent and live lives of repentance. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll now place the offering on the altar. We come, O Savior, to your throne to give you of our treasure, who by your love which on the cross was given without measure, your love for us paid out in blood purchased our salvation. Help then our love reflect your love till we live with you in heaven. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. Obeying your Father's will, you endured the cross and scorned its shame. Now you sit at the right hand of the throne of God, governing all things. Lord, we confess that it was for us and for our salvation that you came to this world to suffer and die. You bore our guilt, you endured our punishment, 
you experienced the wrath of God in our place. For your unselfish sacrifice on our behalf, help us show our gratitude to you in everything we think, say, and do. As we walk through life, keep us from becoming entangled by sin. Remove all obstacles and stumbling blocks and keep us from falling or going astray. Help us run with perseverance the race that you have marked out for us. When that way involves pain, suffering, or persecution, help us view these things as evidence of your loving discipline intended to draw us ever closer to you. We thank you for the 89 years of grace you have granted to your servant, Louis Schultz. We praise you for being with him in good days and evil, joy and sorrow, and sickness and health. We praise you above all for having provided him with the rich comfort of your word and sacraments. Continue to make these treasures his joy and delight, be his strength even when earthly strength fails, and finally bring him and all of us to the joy and glory of eternal life in your presence. We also, thank, we also ask that you be with Bethany Schultz, who is the daughter of Daryl and Corey Schultz and granddaughter of Louie and Marlene Schultz. She's leaving for Japan to work for Friends of Asia. Be with her, guard and protect her from all harm and danger. Give her health and strength, perform the work given to her, and bring her safely back to her family again. Be with Kaylee Lynn Fahrenholtz, who will be baptized in our late service. Grant her the new life of forgiveness, joy, and peace. Help us all to continue to carry out our responsibilities to those who are baptized so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with Mr. Drews as he now accepted a call to St. Paul's in Rapid City, South Dakota. Grant him the wisdom to use his gifts faithfully and to fulfill his ministry at his new place of service. Be with us as we now extend a call for a new principle. Allow our call to be answered quickly. O Lord, ruler of nations and savior of all people, we pray that you would look with mercy on our world now engaged in war and bring this conflict to a rapid end. We bow to your will and hold fast to your promise that you are ruling the world for the welfare of those who love you. Be with and protect those who are in the middle of this conflict. We know, Lord, that the ultimate cause of war is sin. Lead each of us to repent of our sins and hold fast to your forgiving love. When you determine to restore peace, grant that what is just and right in your eyes will prevail. Look on your church, O Lord, here and in every place. Grant that we and all who bear the name of Christ may daily offer up to you the acceptable sacrifices of repentance, thanksgiving, and loving obedience. Hear our prayer, and by your mercy, grant our petition for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated for the next hymn.
right? We pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated.